Welcome to the Profitable Farmer Podcast, where it's all about increasing the profitability of your farm by working smarter, not harder. G'day and welcome once again to Profitable Farmer. This is Jeremy Hutchings and it's great to have you listening in again from wherever you are around Australia. Um, It is 6.30 on a Monday morning here in the Maramar Valley and um, I've just enjoyed a wonderful weekend with David Westbrook and Becky and his amazing three kids as they embark on and um, enjoy a national tour on behalf of Farm Owners Academy visiting all our clients across Australia. And, you know, with COVID last year, we weren't able to get on farm to see our clients and it's such an important part of the journey that they're on with us. Um, So to have Westy swing in in the Farm Owner Academy car and caravan with his family and have a break from all the homeschooling and all of the wonderful things that he and Becky are doing with their family Um, and to hear some of the stories of the visits that he's enjoyed so far and the impact that I guess those meetings have on our clients Um, and to hear a little bit about where Westy and Becky are off to as they make their way up into central New South Wales and then northern and then southern Queensland and then they're up into Cape York to head across the top of Australia. I just thought I'd grab Westy while he was here and we'd um, have a bit of time just connecting and reflecting on um, this whole journey and sharing some of the amazing stories of what our clients are up to um, around Australia. So, Westy, we've uh, enough said. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Hush. Great to be here and get out of everyone that's that's listening at the moment. Um, thank you for welcoming welcome, welcoming me onto your farm and having a couple of or two or three great days with your family. Yeah, it's been amazing. Nice to see our kids getting on. It is. <laughs> and, and our wives. Yeah. <laughs> it, <That helps. laughs> it does help. So um, about six months ago, Westy, or probably even a little bit more, you had the idea of this road trip um, as a way of us catching up post-COVID on these really important client visits. And um, you pitched the idea to Greg and I and we jumped on it and now we've got a car and caravan that's branded FOA. Um, and you and your family are homeless ultimately and, and touring. How is it? It's amazing. So the home does have wheels. Yeah, so um, as part of the, the coaching role in Farm Owners Academy, we like to get out on the farm once in the three years um, or, or someone get out to the farm and just connect with the farmer, see the landscape, see what's happening out there, see it just helps us get a, a bit of a visual of what's happening. Um, we couldn't do that last year with COVID and um, we sorely missed that. So... It was a great opportunity to reset and, and rethink how we can how we, we can do that this year, um, and that's where the the caravan idea come from. Something we always wanted to do as a family. Um, yes, yeah, so I pitched that to you and Greg, and it all made sense. We did some pretty heavy analysis on it to make sure it all stacked up, um, and yeah, very very excited to, to be out on the road visiting some farms. We had some cracking farm visits so far. So we left on the fifth of January. Um, we had three weeks around southern Victoria. We back to Kangaroo Island um, for Becky's book launch that um, that will be officially launched in April. Um, we had an event in Adelaide over the, the second to last week of February there, and we've been on the road for another three weeks and found ourselves here. It's perfect. So, as you reflect on, I guess the first six weeks of the trip so far, um, visits. Any stories to tell about, I guess, some amazing things that our clients are focusing on and uncovering? Yeah, absolutely. There's no no stitch ups. There's no I haven't un- uncovered any um, any goss behind the scenes that I can stitch someone up with. But um, <laughs> um, no, absolutely fantastic. So probably my biggest takeaway really is how amazing the agricultural industry is, and and the, and that the farming community. So we almost felt like we've been welcomed in the Christmas dinner every time we pull up on a farm to, to stay. Um, very, very welcomed. Um, some of the, the, the farm visits, um, it, it's, it's, everyone is so different. Every single, every single visit is so different. The, the people, the, the personalities, the way the farms are run. Um, the biggest takeaway is that everyone is so focused in what they've got. A lot, of, a lot of farmers have grown up on the farm and they've taken over the farm. So they're, they're generational farmers 
So for me to be able to come in and for the family to be able to come in and see what they're up to from an outside perspective is really, really helpful, I think. Um, can be some little tweaks that, not that I'm a genius coach or anything like that, but you can just, a couple of little comments can um, help people change the, the way they look at things. Um, and probably the biggest one is inspiration. I um, had a, a few people will te- have texted me or emailed me after our fun visit saying, hey, thanks, Westy, for the visit. You just re- reinvigorated us or re-inspired us to, to keep cracking on with our goals. There's a really important piece in that. I think we go to consultants to get specific advice and have them make decisions with and for us. I think the thing about coaching um, is that we are just a fresh perspective. And I actually think to a large degree um, it can be anyone you respect and trust that can step in as a mentor and a coach to you. It doesn't have to be that the coach is the expert. But what is important in decision-making and planning um, is that fresh perspective. I think it's such a good point, Westy, and I use that analogy that I can't see my own golf swing. So I can try and improve my golf swing um, consistently week on week for three years and get some results probably, or I can swing a coach in and that coach doesn't have to be the world's best golfer, but just for having someone see my golf swing from an outside looking in just offers me a different perspective, one or two fresh things to focus on, and it can be those fresh little things to focus on that can be the big thing, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the the keys to these farm visits as well is a bit of strategy around that. So generally what what it looks like is it will spend an hour or so driving around the farm. Um, We'll have a cup of tea or um, or a lunch, and then we'll probably spend two or three hours grab the computer out and, and work through what we call the Clarity Action Planner, which is the the values, the the purpose of, of what you're trying to achieve, which a lot of people get stuck on. Mm-hmm. And, um, and if anyone listening doesn't have a written down purpose or, or niche or why, why do you actually farm? What, what drives you to jump out of bed every morning? If you don't have that written down across the top of your whiteboard in your office or something, I recommend that you do it. So mm-hmm. that's a great conversation in itself. Yeah, um, because otherwise we get trapped in that that farming that same year in. So we're trying to get a bigger wheat crop or a bigger um, heavier steers or whatever it might be, but there's no real deeper meaning to it. Um, probably another one just on that too is a lot of people say that's for their that they're farming for the next generation, which is amazing. But with like Dig said in your last podcast, we need to farm for the next generation, but we also need to farm for ourselves. So what what does what does that mean? Because I think. Often, as parents, we do everything for our kids through their early years, and as they get older, that it can become that our mindset is creating a legacy, creating an asset base, creating a farm that can survive and succeed through succession and give our kids an incredible start. Um, What does it mean to change our thought process around that and put ourselves first, perhaps. It's a great conversation to be had, that's for sure, Um, and an interesting one. Something I'm pretty passionate about is making that work, making making that intergenerational sort of um, farming business work. Um, I think we tend to put so much, I actually reckon it comes back to not having a purpose. What's your your personal purpose? purpose in life mm. or we, what's what do you want to achieve in the farm um and i think we actually and this is not everyone this is just sort of some people and, and how i see it is that we can actually make an excuse to why we're farming so we can use our, the next generation i want to grow the farm i've got three sons home on the farm i want to buy three four four farms so i can give one each to the son have one for myself which is good it keeps you busy but there's not a well, we can get caught up in putting our kids at the finish line. So our kids come home from school, they come home to a farm that mum and dad have built um, and they're not really challenged, um, potentially not really challenged to go and grow a business themselves. And what we end up doing is mum and dad do the books until they're 60 or 70 so that the son and the daughter-in-law or the daughter and the son-in-law um, 
don't have to try, don't have to build that business mindset until they're in their forties and fifties, and then which can be easy. It's the easy road, but it's also the hard road because they're not getting the freedom that they need um, to create that vision. So yeah, yeah. Awesome, Westy. I love that concept of, of would we really want to arrive our kids to the finish line? Um, I distinctly remember when I proposed to Jane, we had $122 combined in our bank account. And part of what I'm proud of is the construct of starting with nothing in my lifetime and seeing what I can create. Um, I do find it interesting in agriculture because I think it's different in agriculture to other industries that we feel like we have a responsibility to um, leave a significant asset base to our children. Um, I think it's a really interesting construct and I'm not making it wrong, um, but I just think that sometimes we do that unconsciously because it's what's been done before us rather than it be a conscious choice. So I love what you're saying there about um, being really clear on what it is that is your purpose for you. Forget about your kids. Forget about other participants in and around your family. What is it that you as the chief of the business absolutely want for you and your partner perhaps? Yeah. Get real clarity on the vision, your why, your 10-year goals and some of the longer-term thinking and getting that committed to paper so that you're enrolled and inspired around that and then coming back to, okay, well, what can that mean for my family? Yeah, absolutely. I clearly, one of our members in the Platinum Program um, had submitted their a, a draft version of their family action plan to me and that was um, her purpose was exactly to hand over a, a successful business to the next generation. Um, and I was pretty happy to call her on that and said, yeah, but that's a bit of, that's an excuse. Um, what's your purpose? And her answer was, oh, I haven't actually thought about that. I don't have one. I don't have one. Mm. I'm, I was, my parents kept telling me I'm working hard for you. So then she thought she had to work hard for her kids. But the reality is, yeah, like you said, put us first. What's our purpose? What do we want to achieve out of the business and out of life? And then make that work for the next generation if it can as well. The extension of that, I think, is in doing that, you're actually empowering the next generation. 100%. Because if it's all about them in my generation, then what if they arrive to the finish line and it's not the race that they want to be running in? Yeah. You know, we're making a presumption that they want what it is that we're trying to build for them. So I think there's freedom for me in letting go of trying to build this thing for them mm -hmm. and it's liberating for them that as the older generation that we're going after goals for us rather than goals for them. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's a cracking conversation, isn't it? It is, yeah. I... I one of, a little bit of experience for me was Becky. So when I when I met Becky, her I come from a farming background where you hand over that multi million dollar business inheritance. She came from um, a non farming background where you pay for yourself to go to uni, you work after you work after uni to pay uni, and, and you sort of have you yeah you rent a dodgy little house in in some suburb in town to to try and pay your way where. I couldn't, when I met her, I couldn't see that life because I was, I was at, the fin at, at the finish line to a degree. I, I was lucky enough to grow up on a pretty successful um, farm in a, in a farming business and farming family. Um, so that was a really great learning curve for me to see her family enjoying life potentially more with so much less. And I look at all my friends who are in other industries, you know, a mate of mine his father was a very successful lawyer locally um, and that son came back into the region and didn't do law but has pioneered a really successful company in our region from a standing start. And another one decided to leave the farm and go and do accounting, yeah. went through a union and now has a really significant accounting practice. And there are so many examples of um, the next generation if we back them, 
achieving a huge amount for themselves without the pressure of taking on the family farm. So I think it just speaks to the importance of self first and then getting really clear on core vision and a significant why and just give ourselves permission to put ourselves first. I think it's such an important starting point for strategic planning. Yeah. So my next question, Westy, is if we were to drive onto 100 farms over your next few months that were not clients of ours, how many of them do you think would have a documented strategic plan? Good question. Two. Two out of 100? Two out of 100. So you mentioned Clarity Action Plan as the method by which we are passionate about helping people get a really concise, powerful, actionable, strategic plan for their future as farmers. Would you mind just touching on the broad headlines or structure of the Clarity Action Plan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think in um, that last conversation was an absolute ripper and, and what we, just to close that off, I think we try and manufacture the, the future and the future for our kids when if we can build that uh, self-purpose, then we can sit back and everything will unfold 10 times better than we can envision it. So, yeah. Um, right, so the, the Clarity Action Plan really is based on, on core values um, and core values can be a bit of a fluffy kind of word for, for a lot of farmers. It was for me when I first learned the concept and I didn't really get it, but then when I got it, you realise the power of it, especially in a family business when core values can almost be a rule. They can, they can set boundaries and set rules within team alignment. Um, so, for example, if one of your... Um, one, of, one of my values is passion. Um, and what is passion? Passion for me means always be working on something you're passionate about. Um, so if you're not passionate about it, why you're going to question yourself, why, why are we actually doing this? Um, communication, integrity, whatever, the, whatever they might be. So I, what, the way that I help clients do this is what are your values? We might get 10 or 15 and then prioritise them into one to five. Um, and all of a sudden, there, there's five words on a page. They don't necessarily... What, what does integrity mean to you when it's one word? It's hard to sort of understand that. But if you can put a sentence behind it, so integrity means ABC, um, bang, it has a lot of power. So values is number one. Number two we just talked about, which is the purpose. Um, niche, what, what can you be the best at? What do you love? So... Um, uh, one of our clients, Cameron, obviously one of his niches has been the best wool grower in, in the world, isn't it? Australia or the world, one or two. Tagline, only the finest. So his, his finest. intention is to be you know, in the top 5% of wool producers globally and he's well on the way. But, <clears throat> again, a vision like that um, is motivating and, and gets him in motion. Coming back to that comment we made before, Westy, and with Cameron and Kate in mind, um, that vision enrolls and inspires his team, family and non-family, because they're going after being the best. That's the same construct that Gillette or um, Toyota or so many other visions are. If the vision is to make a heap of money so that I can leave a legacy for my children, that doesn't enrol and inspire my employers. No. Why would I come and work for you if your vision is to provide for your children? I reckon a vision that is only the finest, the, to be in the top 5% of wool producers globally, that truly is an enrolling and inspiring vision for all members of the team, family and non-family. So I love that. And the core values piece, again, with Kate and Cameron in mind, they've worked so hard to get really clear on what are those um, codes and rules that underpin not just their family but the business as well. And what I find once we're clear on core values, and you're right, a lot of people think it is fluffy and it's just they're just walls, words on a wall or something like that. But in my experience, every decision we make can be made with those front of mind. It makes decision-making at every level of farming and family so much clearer 
when we are clear on our core values. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you, you're always coming back to them and asking yourself that question. Is this aligned with my values? Which our values are in us. We've got, all got them in us. We all, they're there. Sometimes we've got to dig a little bit to find out exactly what they are. Um, they are who we are. Mm. Um, yeah, so team alignment, huge. Purpose, huge. Um, next one is the 10-year target. So 10-year ten, ten ten year goal setting. Um, really, really tricky one. For a lot of clients, it definitely was for me. So the, ten, the, ten, the way that I look at the 10-year goal, it, how to set a 10-year goal is what do I want and what do I want it. So you can say, okay, what do I want? Um, and this is, if, if you know how to get to your 10-year goal, it's not big enough. Um, so most people set their 10-year goal by going how. Okay, so they might, you might say, say farm 3,000 acres. Well, let's double that to six because I think the neighbours might come up or this will happen. I've got two sons coming home in 10 years' time. I reckon I can get a six. They're already looking at the how. But if you say, okay, I'm going to have 10,000 acres in Canada or 10,000 acres in Western Australia, no idea how to do that. It's pretty scary. It's very challenging. But then you go say, okay, that's what, but why? Why, why, why would I want 10,000 acres in Canada? Is that just an elusive goal that is going to take me away from my values? So, so the what is the big, the big dreamy big, hairy, audacious goal, but then you definitely got to make sure you got to ask yourself that why. What, it, is that aligned with my values? Because some farmers just want to farm 1,500 acres and, and almost be a hobby farmer to a degree, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that if that's aligned with their values. So that's why the values are so important. If um, So family, fun, adventure, courage, passion, love, they're my key values. Um, so family, family and adventure, if I'm going to try and build 10,000 acres in Canada, I'm probably going to be going against my value of family because I'm going to be working pretty hard, um, adventure, et cetera. So um, that's really important. Um, just before you go on, I hope, guys, you just can hit, hit that. Once you're clear on your core values and you've got those in order, then when we go down to set 10-year goals, it's so important, and this is where I think a coach can be really helpful in making sure that the 10-year goals and the journey toward those 10-year goals are actually going to be in line with our core values and our higher moral purpose. Yeah. Because um, I do see that a lot. People put family as their number one value um, and Adventure is their second value, and then do exactly what you say, Wesley. They go right now. We're going to go after thirty thousand acres, and the, the question should be asked again, so that it's a conscious check, not an unconscious one. Am I going to be able to live life as I journey toward that ten-year goal, true to my values, or exactly to your point, is the attainment of those goals going to bring? My ability to live life true to my values into question. I yeah. just think it's such a it's such a key point. Yeah, absolutely. And and I've just had a farm visit um, last week with it that was going through exactly that. So blinkers on to a degree. Bang, let's grow this farm to we can go ABC. We can get to this this amount in ten years time. Um, but then okay, what uh, what about your personal? What are you trying to achieve on a personal level? They'd completely forgotten about that. Um, so it's quite exciting to be to the dem saying, "Oh, hang on a sec. We need to actually focus on what, what are we actually what's it, what are we trying to achieve in life? Yes, we can grow a farm to X amount of acres, but are we missing the point somewhere? So they're to come back and reassess that um, and see how they can balance, balance the two. So a business and the business that sits on top of your farm that does the farming is just a vehicle to give you or me or us what we want in life and you know in outside of agriculture again <clears throat> excuse me it's it's easier and clearer because if i've got a landscape gardening company i don't really have an asset so i've got to make that business work so that it can give me what i want in life and so if we apply that same thinking to agriculture the business of farming is just a vehicle to give us what we want and so I think when it comes to the 10-year goal-setting piece, Westy, it should start with personal yeah. and family and um, all of those other 
components that you've mentioned, learning, community, charity, all of those things, and then go, right, I will now, if this business is just a vehicle to help us get that, what does the business need to look like so that we can have all of those things? Yet what most people do is they sit down and the first goal they want, right, is to go from 5,000 to 8,000 acres to be big. It's, it's a bit bigger than the It's neighbors. the other way around, isn't it? They put the business first yeah. and they put the things that they need for the business to do a distant second or third. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? 100%. If you ask a farmer why, what do you, if you ask any farmer why do they farm, what do you reckon their answer is? I don't think most would know. No. Well, my, but to get bigger. Well, to, for most of me, they'll say lifestyle, I reckon. So what, okay. what, what, do you love, what do you love farming? Lifestyle. Get to be your own boss. You can go and do what you want. You can you can kick around the farm and you're in nature and etc. And then you say, well, are you getting that? Well, probably not because mm-hmm. they're stuck in busyness and um, they don't, haven't really – they've. we all come home on the farm because it's an amazing opportunity, amazing lifestyle. Um, we can spend a lot of time with our – we can knock off at 3 o'clock and go pick the kids up off the school bus or go to their swimming carnival, et cetera. But the reality is most people aren't getting to that. Um, yeah, and, and what, what I love about the agriculture, agricultural industry and what we see is that we've got members – in our platinum program or in our programs that one of them wants to go outside and just drench the sheep and drive the tractor and put some fence posts in because that's what they absolutely value. Um, and then we've got people like Andrew Fowler that um, the enough to scholar from Esperance who wants to grow, what's it, 80,000 acres or 100,000 acres or something to give, using that as a tool to give him what he wants. So if some people want to use the farming to get to A and someone to use to get to B. So it's really important. That's coming back to that purpose. So identifying what it is. If you if you want to just be outside putting in fence posts, then how do we set your business up to allow you to do that and enjoy it and still be profitable? With balance. Yep. With balance. Yep. Yep. So on just on this too, I think most people massively underestimate what they can achieve in 10 years but then significantly overestimate what they can achieve in one or two. Yeah, yeah. And so when we get down to the 10-year goal-setting piece, it can be a real stretch for people. And to your point before, it's got to be at least a little bit unattainable. You don't need to have the answers as to what it actually is going to look like. Um, Some of it needs to be a little bit mystical because that means that you're stretching yourself perhaps beyond... um, an attainable goal. Um, but just on that too, I want our listeners just for a minute to listen, just to stop and think about where you were 10 years ago. How old were you? How old were your kids? What was the season like? I'm pretty sure you'll be able to recite that one pretty accurately. And now think about how many seconds and minutes have gone under your bridge between then and now. And I guess the reality is we've all got all the time we need um, beyond our comprehension. We've all got lots of 10-year chunks ahead of us. So we've all got more time than we could possibly need to achieve the goals that we have. Um, So then using that same construct of looking backwards 10 years, now throw that forward 10 years, what you can achieve in the next 10 years can be beyond your comprehension. Um, What I'm really inspired about is just the level of optimism in our industry at the moment, even compared to three or four or five years ago. Um, Finally, we're seeing really good meat and even wool and commodity prices and um, you know, we're finding ways through technology to be even more productive um, and more efficient than we've ever been before. So we've got every reason, I think, to be very optimistic about the industry we're in. And so I guess what I'm wanting to suggest is, is set optimistic goals that are beyond your comprehension that you don't know how you're going to achieve yeah. because we've got all, all got all the time we need to get them done. And what's most important in the starting of that journey is getting those people around you 
on the same page and aligned to a common set of core values, a common purpose statement, a common 10-year vision that everyone is enrolled to, to help make happen. Once you've got that alignment, getting those goals are so much easier than trying to get it done without alignment, which just speaks to the importance of those those chunks of the strategic plan that we've already spoken to, Westy. Yeah, absolutely. And what else, um, if you're an older generation as well, so many of you might say, I'm, I should have done, I'm too old to set a 10-year target. If you're in your late 50s, 60s, 70s, it doesn't matter. I think it's the older you might be, the more important it is to set a 10-year target. Just reinvigorate, it reinvigorates and re-inspires you to live uh, an exciting life. There's so much opportunity out there um, that as soon as you set those goals, have that conversation. Bring some people in. We've got, um, I know Jack, one of our members, has just got, um, he's obviously got our program around him, but he goes out and he's, he's buying, uh, inviting superstars in the industry for a cup of coffee down the street and going and visiting their farms and, and helping him set massive 10 year goals um, just to get him super excited. And it, 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 it excites me to be able to even talk to him about what his goals are. So um, mm-hmm. go away and have a think about how you can set some exciting 10 year goals, reinvigorate what you want to be able to achieve. Um, and the doors will open. Remember, all you're going to be is in motion towards a goal and doors will open that you can't even comprehend. So, so much of your 10-year goal now will not even, will be so far from what you would think it will be. It's not funny, but you've got to be in motion for those, those doors and opportunities to open. So this allows us to perhaps touch on a bit more of the spiritual side that plays out once you have clarity. And, you know, two people in our lives Tracy Seacom, one of our coaches, and and certainly Dig for me, who we got to interview and speak with last set, last episode, um, deeply believe in once you've got clarity, then the universe can conspire to give you what it is that you want. Yeah. And so, have ever any of you ever thought, you know, I want to really want to white land cruiser you with the black bull bar. That's that's my goal. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, that's all you see on the highway. Yeah. Or and I, I think too, if I walk into a supermarket and I don't know what I want, all I see is noise. And I walk around aimlessly and my, you know, I, I my mind has to consume and take on so much information. But if I walk into a supermarket and all I need is eggs and orange juice, I don't see all the noise. I I know I my mind and all of the signs and everything just directs me automatically to the eggs and the orange juice and I'm in and out of there so much more effortlessly and I think that's kind of a metaphor for life that once you have clarity on who you are what you stand for and where you're off to then your mind is just a filter yeah Um, and once you give it focus now be this spiritual or be this a neuroscience piece about how the mind works once you give have focus and give your mind focus and then put that out into the universe. Um, everything conspires to give you that. Yeah. And that's where I think the 10-year goals don't have to be logical and attainable. You can go, you know what, I want to go on a four-month holiday skiing with mates in Canada and have my farm work without me. Um, I've got no idea how I'm going to get that done, but that is my 10-year goal. Um, you don't have to have the answers because then you just get to trust that the, the four inches of real estate between your ears and this amazing thing called universe just conspire to find a way to help you make the unknowable happen. Yeah. Is that a fair comment? I know yeah. you believe deeply in manifesting goals and even this car and caravan and that you and your family are driving around this trip, you manifested this, yeah. I think, setting an intention well before perhaps you had that first conversation with Greg and I? Absolutely. Yeah, I set a goal to, and I don't know where it come from, um, set a goal to get a sponsored car and caravan to travel Australia. And three months later, that 10-year goal fell into place. Mm-hmm. I was talking to one of our uh, members. His partner had a, um off-farm goal, 10-year goal that she, that she set just after she joined our program. Um, and that was to to work with a, a publisher 
so to be, I um, can't remember the exact title that she wanted with a publishing company, but he was telling me the story the other day that, yeah, she, Sabrina set his goal, his 10-year goal to be, to be able to work with this publishing company, and he goes, and it happened a month later. Mm. Ten year goal happened happened within one month. And so often what we see and that we're privileged enough to see is that when people set down those 10 year unattainable, hairy, audacious goals, B hags, we call them big or big, hairy, audacious goals, so often they are achieved in two or three years. Yeah. Um, and then we're dusting ourselves off and three years into this journey, they're completely resetting their 10 year goals because they've already achieved. Um, those key goals that they had no idea that they were going to be able to achieve. Yeah, definitely. So you th- coming back to what you said, um, that yeah, your, your thoughts become reality. So if you think that everything goes against you, that's your reality. If you think if you think the, the world, the universe, whatever you want to call it, is rigged in your favour, everything will work for you. So thoughts become your reality. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um, what, how we speak is just an outward expression of our thoughts. So taking control of our mindset and the thoughts that play out in our mind about what, we, what is possible and what we're capable of are such an important part of this whole construct. Yeah. Perhaps before we touch on the mindset piece, though, I see two types of people, Westy. One is the ones who are really good at short-term planning. They're really good at setting down their production plan and and getting this year done really effectively and efficiently. And I think there are a lot of blokes out there that pride themselves and a lot of their identity is around how well they get the plan executed within a season. And then the other type of people are the big picture thinkers who are really good at all the stuff we've talked about, about around vision and long-term and all that sort of stuff. I see those people who are really good at the big picture stuff sometimes get to 10-year goals and stop and not have a roadmap to get there. Um, So let's keep going on the conversation. Once you've got a really clear 10-year goal that aligns and enrolls and inspires and is, is all of those things that we've talked about, then coming back, what's next so that the rubber can hit the road? Could you just move through how to chunk that down into actionable steps that allow it, allow us to get in motion um, and have the rubber hit the road. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just to close up for 10 years, we want to make sure we've got some, some KPIs in there um, so you can actually some actual, actual measurables that you can tick off. Our members are ticking them off in three to five years, their, their KPIs. So some of their, their targets that they want to hit Kilograms of wool per hectare, um, profit, team, et cetera, that are very specific so they can, they're not, um, yeah, you, you can tick them. You say, yep, done, done, done. Yeah, so don't say, I want better work-life balance because that, that is, that is not measurable. So that's a disaster. We went and saw Nick and Emma as part of this tour and it was just wonderful to sit with them and, and there's this three months skiing in Canada with friends mm. in three years' time. So they're going to bring their farm under management. Yeah. And that's their goal is to get that done so that the measurable three months skiing in Canada with friends tick, tick. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and that's an incredible story. That's um, for them to be able to work out, okay, that's what we need. We need a manager. We need this. We need that. Bang, bang, bang. And then they work back with, so, okay, what do I need to do this 90 days to make that happen? So we'll cover that in a minute. But um, so the next one really is your target market and your marketing strategy. So for me, it, it's not, we don't need to spend a heap of time on that, um, but understanding where you're sending your products um, and some of that can be in your 10-year target as well. So one of my goals was to sell um, non-mules wool in, to Italy direct um, and I got a contract for that probably six months after I set that goal, which at the time I had no idea I was going to be able to hit that, hit that target. Just on that... Having a business model is the thing that sets you free. Yeah. If I don't have a business model, then it's all, all on my shoulders and our family's shoulders to hit the 10-year goal or achieve whatever it is that we've, we've got to. But what's next, I think, and this is where this part of the sequence is really important, is what is the business model and what are the key metrics in and around that business model? Yeah that gets it done because I love that construct that business model trumps hard work every time. It's the businesses that have a really strong 
model around which they're going to scale, that's, that's, that's the key. Otherwise, everyone's working hard. And that's where most small businesses fail because the owner burns out because he hasn't or she hasn't sat down and masterminded the model that is going to work in order to achieve the goals so that the chiefs of that project don't have to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the niche piece and the business model piece and getting the, the design and the architecture of that really well thought out is, is key. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. And then moving on to the next one, which is a, the three-year goal, which is I love the three-year goal because it's, it's still that dreamy space. You don't necessarily need to know how to get it, but it's really, really simple as far as three or four KPIs. What, what's your revenue? How much profit do you want to make? Um, what does your team look like? Two or three KPIs, so key performance indicators, um, and then brain dump might be 10 or 15 bullet points around what does the fund look like. It might be this big, um, you put this capital in, um, you're going on this many holidays, bang, bang, bang. So just, just a brain dumping in, a, in bullet points, a visual of what it actually looks like. So when you're putting your, your three-year goals together, it's, it's a really simple process, um, an exciting process. But it's important that your that, that team focus, so, so business focus. So those um, you're getting input from the whole team, so that the team can see where your business is going. And for those of you that don't have a big team, it's still important for your family to know where you're going, and it's still an important ex- exercise. So when I did this for the first time, I was sole operator, so I was setting three year goals for myself, um, and that was super important. And then as I grew, it's super important to have your, your team aligned as well. One thing we do do, Hutch, is, and listeners, is um, we've had a few businesses where there might be two or three brothers and, and mum and dad or sisters in the business. Set them a way to go do their own three or their own clarity action plan. So their own, what are, what are their values, 10-year goals, blah, 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 and then bring that together. So have that time they might spend three or four hours off as a family. So um, the son and the daughter-in-law, and then bring them together to build a business vision and clarity action plan. So this is a key point, I think. Often in planning meetings, I see people making other people's goals wrong and trying to get theirs in instead of the other. And for what I, I think that is a bit of a win-lose paradigm that we often exist in, <clears throat> and I've touched on this before, but... What I think is really important is when we come back together, each of us having had a go at what we want for our three-year goals, is then to have a really full conversation around how I can get my goals and make sure that everyone else gets theirs as well. So it's not an either-or thing, it's an and thing. And so if you are my brother and we've both been away with our partners and we've got our three-year goals and we come back together, that it's not, oh, well, you want two weeks skiing in Japan, well, I want three weeks skiing in New Zealand, so which one's it going to be? Yeah. It, it's not that, it's both. Yeah. And we've got to expand the pie and make sure that everyone's goals are valued and appreciated. And I, I think about this too for team. I think about Tim and Cheryl and Aaron and Annika and the way in which Tim and Cheryl are bringing them into their business as valued employees. I love the fact that Tim and Cheryl are sitting down with their team and going, right, what is it you want over the next three years? What are your goals as a family? Let's make those part of the goals that we have for the business. How enrolled are our team when we actually sit down and go, right, well, we want to shape the direction of the company and set down goals as a company and as a team that are completely thoughtful of and inclusive of the goals you have as a team member in this business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and this is where this whole piece, this whole goal setting and, and vision building for your business is such a leadership opportunity um, to help not just yourself but the, your, your family and or anyone in your team, your, your staff and your family to be able to understand their vision and help them create a bigger vision for themselves, if that makes sense. So for, for Tim and Cheryl, can they can bring Aaron and Annika in and say, hey, this is what you're thinking. 
why not aim for this mm-hmm. and, and and raise that bar and help them lift and, and get create a bigger vision? So I'm going to put it out there that it used to be that we used to just treat employees as a resource, yeah, almost crudely, like we used to treat our helpers. That they're here, we pay them X, and they are supposed to deliver for us. That has changed. I think if we want to build a high performing team and keep talent long term. We've actually got to, as leaders, demonstrate that we deeply care for every single person in our business. And part of that caring is knowing where they want to go. And to your point, people will stay with leaders who have a, have a bigger vision for them than they do for themselves. So if your employees would like to build a house one day, I reckon you need to help show them how they can build a house pay it off and have three investment properties over the next 10 years because if you've got a bigger vision for them than they have for themselves, they will go the extra mile for you and stay longer, which ultimately is what all all we want as business owners and as leaders from our team. But it starts with us, doesn't it? Absolutely. Just on that, I I like that metaphor, Westy, that, that for me to have a fire that gives me heat First, I've got to put on wood. You know, I can't sit back and go, right, hey, team, you guys have got to turn up and go the extra mile and work 100-hour weeks over harvest and, and sow and do all this stuff and I'm going to pay you the minimum wage. First, you've got to put on wood and then you get heat. Yeah. And so I'm a big believer in being overly generous towards our people, treating what we provide to them as an investment And the more I put into them in terms of salary, bonus, reward, challenge, education, training, the more I get back. So the bigger bit of wood I put on, the more heat I get back. And so I make sure that I'm putting on the very best red gum wood onto that fire so I get a lot of heat back. And including your team in all of these processes is part of the putting on of the very best wood so you get the very best outcome back. We're off to um, a friend of mine's retreat near Chimit in two weeks' time as a leadership team at FOA, and we're locking ourselves away for three nights and two days. And I've just been reminded in this conversation, Westy, that one of the first questions that we need to ask is what is it that each of our team need and want from this project over the next three years yeah. so that we're being congruent with what we've just talked about. It would have been easy for us to have missed that really important step in understanding what each of us want over the next three years so that we can design the strategic plan for FOA to give everyone the best chance of getting that done. Yeah, and that's what a great leader does. And you can't expect, if, if you've got workmen that rock up, you, you just can't expect for a workman just to rock up um, and deliver day in, day out and get frustrated when they don't use their initiative and et cetera, et cetera, common sense. That's back on, that's, that's your responsibility um, to make sure that your workmen are inspired, make sure they're rocking up on time, make sure that they've got a vision, make sure that they understand all the rules, the values, et cetera. So if you can do one thing, this, this was a big game changer um, a few years ago when I was an, uh, a member of the Platinum Program, not an employee of Farm Owners Academy, um, was I, I, I sat down and, and built this vision out and then I sat my workmen down and I said, hey, this is our, this is our vision. And that 10 times his productivity because instead of him trenching sheep, 2,000 sheep in the sheep yards and got to knock them out for a whole day, it's, that's just not just a, a job anymore. That's part of a bigger goal because he knows trenching those 2,000 sheep that day and then another 2,000 rolling tomorrow and another 2,000 the day after that, that's part of hitting our KPI of 120% lamb in the readers. So all of a sudden... It completely changes the way that he sees that job. Um, and that's, yeah, across the whole farm. So we better, better move on maybe to the next one. Cracking point, though. Um, and I think this is an alignment um, and an inspirational leadership piece, mm-hmm. this whole construct yeah. that helps um, us be better employers and find and keep good talent. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, the rubber hitting the road, we then come down to one-year goals and, and 90-day or quarterly goals. So you're happy to speak to that? Yep, absolutely. Um, so the one-year the one year goal is, we can see it now, 
it's, it's close enough to see. So it's, it's um, what do you want to achieve in a bullet point? What's maybe 10 or 15 key parts of the business strategy or putting up a new shed, shearing shed, whatever it might be, team, um, bang. What, what, what would you love to, if, how, how can I word this? A way that I word it is if you can get to the end of this year and be over the moon or ecstatic about what you've achieved, what would that actually look like? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Re- really clear, actionable list of one-year outcomes. Yeah. And then we chunk it down into four quarters, four seasons. Yeah. And um, do the same thing again so that the plan we have for this season and what we improve in this season lines up with the goals we have for 12 months. Yeah. The goals we have for three year, the goals yep. we have for ten year, the vision and the the purpose and the big hairy audacious goal. When when all of those things are lined up and in sequence, then everything can unfold from there. But again, what I love about this is that everything that we're doing in this quarter, this season, um, has a higher purpose and is yep. linked to a bigger picture, and that um, is how we get the rubber yeah. to hit the road. Yeah. Can I, can I just share a message that I got from one of our clients after our, our, we spent some time doing this the other day? It basically said, thank you, Westy. Um, our planning filled the soul today. We are now in alignment to success in us growing more within ourselves and our business. Awesome day, awesome people. So that just, hopefully that little, that, that text or that message there helps you understand a little bit about what we're talking about here and, and the importance of what it can do. So, Westy, this is what we call quarterly planning. Um, so, without rushing it, for me, this is the key. So, what are some of the key elements to a strong quarterly plan? Absolutely. So, when I'm on farm this year doing these farm visits, one for, what I, the real intention for me is to come away with our clients having a strong quarterly plan. So, we, we said that, what we've talked about for the last... 45 minutes or so, the 10 year, the values, the 10 year, et cetera. And then we really get down to the magic now, which is the quarterly planning. So what is how do we capture what we've talked about, the, the one and the three probably, now into strategies for this quarter? So um, we don't want we, they're not they're not operational. They can't be operational, they've got to be strategic. So what so one can be um, what I'd like to call the scorecard. So a lot of the time, a lot of farmers need to work on their scorecard. So that's their data. So benchmark, um, budget, P&Ls, capital allocation plans, et cetera. So everything money-wise and, and figure-wise, data-wise. Um, so the strategy is can be worded just scorecard. And then how do we what, – what does that mean as a 90-day goal or 90-day strategy? So then we have another template which now breaks that down. So the top is scorecard, and then what needs to happen A B C D E to tick off that 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 rock. So it might be meet with bank manager, um, Hutch, and a date. So it's got a name and a, and a due date, and then it might be um, refinance. It might be um, do your benchmark. It might be build a system around data collection in the sheep enterprise. So you might be shearing might be coming up and need to collect all the, the wool weights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so everything that needs to, every little job that now needs to happen under that strategy. So it goes, so so for example, just to break that down a little bit, your one year goal, break that into 90 days, the 90 days is broken into a job, a task. Perfect. And a couple of key points. One, this is not operational because everyone gets lost in their operation. And that's at the expense of doing business development activity. And so I think you're exactly right. Getting down to key, what are the key projects that we've got to nail in this next 90 days? And then I think about 90 days or a quarter is 13 weeks. If you can spend a week designing it, then you can just do 12 weeks of implementation. And so the, the action list under each project is powerful, especially where you have people and team around you because you can go, right, the project is scorecard. Here are the six key action steps. Here's who's going to do it and when it's going to be done by. 
the thing I find amazing with my team doing strategic uh, quarterly planning is that we'll come into a quarter with eight projects. That is my opportunity at the start of the quarter to delegate seven of them. So I've got a team jumping over themselves to take on these projects so they can be part of the growth story. And so if you take time to slow down and dedicate this time at the start of each quarter to setting down this actionable growth plan for the quarter, then you can delegate whole strategic projects to team members and have them empowered to get those done. It's a massive leverage point for the chief of any business in my experience. Absolutely. So, for example, Jack, Sam and Greg, I was on the phone with them the other day um, and they hadn't done much of this planning. So one of their 90-day goals was to, um, what's the word, uh, to have a timely plan, a uh, timely sowing or planting, depends where in Australia you live, what yes. you call it, seeding, <laughs> seeding, sowing, planting. Um, so timely, a timely sowing is their strategy for this 90 days. So, so one, of, one of their strategies. So now they can break that down. What needs to, what needs to happen? What falls under that? So ordering fur, chemical, um, they, that one was to build a, a, a paddock by paddock plan. So when they finish sowing paddock six, where do they go next? So if you can think about even the little efficiencies that come by having a paddock plan, so when their workman rolls into paddock six, knowing that paddock 10 is his next paddock to take the tractor into, potentially he's already put the diesel cart and the service unit in paddock 10 because he knows that that's where he's going next. So there's a, instead of him sort of, do you know what I mean? Like there can be, because everyone's the whole team's thinking ahead. Yeah. There can be little efficiencies that keep that process evolving. This is this is the transition from being reactive as a business to being proactive yeah. and having a team that is thinking for you rather than you having to do all the thinking, make all the decisions, do all the business improvement stuff for, by yourself. And so the quarterly planning piece is a massive leverage point. Yeah. Now, what we're not going to do today is go into daily huddles, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, yeah. quarterly planning meetings, annual plan. The agendas and what we recommend around how to get this stuff done, we can come back to. Yeah. But just for our listeners, this whole strategic plan that we call the Clarity Action Plan, it fits on three pages. Yeah. And it's concise in design so that it doesn't go in a cupboard or on a bookshelf and collect dust. It's a plan that you're constantly refining, constantly updating. And the revisit, it's been proven that people, businesses that operate to a quarterly planning method achieve seven times more business improvement in a normal year than a business that runs with an annual planning method. Yeah. So I can't underestimate the importance of that quarterly planning. And then your weekly meetings are just holding people accountable to what they agreed to do in the quarterly meeting in the implementation of those business business improvement priorities. Yeah. And just reminding you what your focus is. So Jack said to me the other day, after we set that quarterly plan, um, so it's important that everyone's got their, their allocated to ownership of a, of a job as well. Um, so he was, so we went through all, everything that needed to happen to have a timely sewing, put someone's name by each of them. So they, they own it, like repairs yeah. and maintenance. For the all the to get everything prepared for sewing, uh, Sam was going to own that. So it's his response. Even though everyone's going to do do the jobs, Sam is ownership has ownership to make sure that everyone implements that. Um, and then they went away. I had the weekly meeting, that first weekly meeting, and Jack said to me, he "said it was nine o'clock in the morning. They'd done a whole day's work just because they got organised in the morning, sat down, debriefed for fifteen or twenty minutes, bang, got out there, and they he, he was blown away with their productivity." So. And this is working smarter, not harder, and this is slowing down to speed up. Yeah. Um, such an important method. So I hope, I hope to all of you that you found us unpacking that useful. Um, it's a really important component of how we turn up and support clients, and I think it does allow families and teams to move forward strongly and quite powerfully with real clarity and with real alignment. So, Westy, with planning and journeying and all those things in mind. Um, coming back to the FOA tour in the car and caravan, 
where to from here and what's the journey look like and what are you most looking forward to? Uh, good question. So hopefully that gives everyone a bit of an insight to what our farm visits might look like, what we've just talked about. Um, from here, so we're just yeah, north of Gundagai at the moment um, on Jeremy and Jane's farm. And we are in this area for another couple of weeks. Obviously, we're at Chermit for our annual planning. And then we head up to, to Byron Bay. We're not going to do too much detail. We head up to, to Byron Bay um, for Easter around the Dubbo area. Then we're up and head up to, to Queensland, see our Queensland clients. Um, and then uh, that'll bring us about the middle of June. Um, and then June, July, August will be across the top. So Cape York, Arnhem Land, Northern Territory, Kimberleys, um, and then getting down towards Perth at this stage around November, December, um, and then back across the Nullarbor, back to, to KI by Christmas or yeah, ready to put the kids back in school for 2022. And so there'll be over 80, maybe 100 farm visits over that time, and that's a, a huge amount of work and a huge amount of support offering that in-depth strategic planning guidance that we've just spoken about. So on behalf of our team, thanks to you and Becky for taking this on and for making it such an adventure and for adding so much value to our clients as you tour. It's very much appreciated, mate. No worries. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, for anyone who wants to follow it, so we're, we're, we're sharing our journey on the Farmers Academy Facebook page. So there's a few sort of pillars to that. We want to bring... Um, a bit of a, a segment, local faces. So I'm going to be interviewing random people in communities just to bring back what community means to them um, to, sh to share with you guys. Heaps of photos and interviews with our farmers. Um, uh, some fast five, so just quick quick interviews with, with some farmers. And, yeah, we, we want to be able to connect, especially across the top of Australia where we don't have many members, where we won't be doing many member visits. Um, yeah, if you know of any places we want to go, we want to have a, a heap of fun, do as many adventures as we can, do some masters, get on horseback, whatever opportunities open up to us, um, make sure we get in touch through um, through Facebook and, um, yeah, we're, we're just going to have a heap, heap of fun and bring as much of that back to, to you guys as we can. Awesome, mate. Well, great having you here. Thank you again for your time and um, really enjoyed, as I always do, a conversation with you and great to be able to record it and call it a podcast. Thanks for having me, Hutch. Pleasure, mate. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for joining in and we'll look forward to checking in with you again in a couple of weeks' time. All the best with your strategic planning um, and aligning your team to a really clear direction. Take care, guys. Thank you and bye for now.